to this computer. Okay, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Lauren Croyes, Associate Professor of History of Art and Faculty Director of the Hearst Museum of Anthropology here at UC Berkeley. Along with Lee Rayford, Associate Professor of African American Studies, I'm the co-instructor of LNS 25, Public Art and Belonging. Today's event is part of a series of public lectures and conversations organized for this class. Many things are different today than our norm, but in considering public art and belonging, we still recognize that this class takes place on the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. I'm hosting this Zoom from Doe Library, and some of you may still be on campus. Regardless of where you are physically, we recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. We acknowledge and pay respect to Ohlone ancestors, peoples today, and the Ohlone future to come. This lecture series and the course explore relationships between art and belonging, race and place, history, memory, and the imagining of just futures. As you know, if you're watching this, UC Berkeley has currently canceled or postponed all large events and has asked instructors to move course content online at least until the end of spring break. I'm not sure where we'll be for the coming months, but for the full schedule and more information, see BAM PFA or Art and Design's website. We're hoping to be back after break with dance director Ronnie Favors, Cafe Alone co-founders Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, artist Kanupa Hansa Luger, playwright Dustin Chen. And in our final public lecture, students will present their own proposals for Berkeley's campus. Of course, an undertaking of this magnitude would not be possible without generous support, logistical, financial, and otherwise. And this course is part of the Thinking Through Art and Design at Berkeley, supported by the Office for Arts and Design, a campus initiative under the steady and visionary leadership of Professor Shannon Jackson that connects and fortifies the creative life of departments, schools, centers, museums, and student clubs throughout the Berkeley campus and in the Bay areas regionally collaborating. Arts and Design, or A plus D, has organized the Berkeley Arts Passport, offers course grants and curative pedagogy, and co-curates a range of public lecture series, which are all impacted by this uh, shutdown. All expenses for this course, including our teaching, our graduate student instructors, our student access to the arts, and, community, and this community lecture series is made possible for A plus D and generous philanthropic donations. So this week, we're lucky to virtually welcome Oakland-based artist, Jesus Esparza, and Melanie Cervantes to discuss their graphic arts collaboration, Dignidad Rebelde. Sorry, I'm getting like a thousand texts. Oh, a lot of our students cannot access this Zoom. Can I please resend the Zoom? Can anyone currently on the Zoom resend the Zoom? I'm in the Zoom. All right, let's just keep going. So, as we'll hear today, Dignidad Rebelde is a graphic arts collaboration that produces screen prints, political posters, and multimedia projects that are grounded in third world and indigenous movements that build people's power to transform the conditions of fragmentation, displacement, and loss of culture that results from histories of colonialism, patriarchy, genocide, and exploitation. Dignidad Rebelde's purpose is to illustrate stories of struggle, resistance, and triumph into artwork that can be put back into the hands of communities that inspire it. Melanie and Jesus are accomplished artists together as Dignidad Rebelde and in their solo practices. Melanie has exhibited extensively nationally and internationally, including at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Her works in the permanent collection of the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, the Latin American collection of the Green Museum at Stanford, at Dartmouth College, and at the Library of Congress, among others. Among her many honors, she's the inaugural recipient of the Two-Year Artisan Residence Fellowship at Communities United for Restorative, Restorative Youth Justice. Melanie also holds a BA in Ethnic Studies from the University of California at Berkeley. Yay! Jesus Barza is an interdisciplinary artist with an MFA in social practice and a master's in visual critical studies from the California College of the Arts. 
He also holds a BA in Raza Studies from San Francisco State University. He's a member of the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative, a decentralized group of political artists working both in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. In 2003, he was a co-founder of the screen printing studio Tala Tubak Amaru uh, that produced political posters and fine art prints. Maraza has exhibited at many national and international venues, including Gallery de la Raza in San Francisco, the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, the El Paso Museum of Art, the De Young Museum, the Mexican Fine Arts Center in Chicago, among others. And among his many honors, he was a recipient of the Art as a Hammer Award from the Center for the Study of Political Graphics. Jesus is also a lecturer in the Ethnic Studies Department at UC Berkeley. So please join me in welcoming Dignidad Rebelde to your screen. <laughs> a little clap reaction. This is like my new favorite thing. Hey, everybody. OK. Hi. So um, Jesus and I are going <clears> to <throat> split up this presentation. I'll do the first half. Um, thank you for uh, being here with us. It's uh, really great that we can find ways, you know, that we're not limited even in challenging times, that we can be creative and still find ways to connect with each other. And, and that kind of connection is so important. I feel like uh, undergirding all of our beliefs, we believe that social change happens through social movements and you can't have anything social without connection between people. So this is a photo of us working in a studio and we are the primary core of Dignidad Rebelde and we really see it as a space for collaboration. We're the core but we are constantly working with other people in various ways and that could be like through collaborations with grassroots organizations or working with other artists or other artist networks. And we've really been driven by um, a shared politic. You know, we really started this project very organically, um, but it came from the shared love of making art, making work, being able to creatively express ourselves. And it evolved into, you know, discussions of what world events had shaped our politics and um, what we believed and how we thought change was made. And um, through those conversations early on, when we started to uh, share our artwork with each other and uh, really started to teach each other the mediums that we knew um, when we first met, uh, I was very, uh, inexperienced in screen printing. I had maybe like one Saturday course that I took after I graduated from Berkeley at Laney College that helped me learn how to screen print, but Jesus had already been printing for a long time, but I was very um, well versed in doing paper cut stencils. So we taught each other the things that we knew. Um, but we also talked about things like the Zapatistas um, uprising and going public in 1994 to declare war against um, the state of Mexico because of the signing of NAFTA. They had been around already for over 10 years, but they finally came out into public view um, really against what we, will, we now know as kind of like this force of uh, neoliberal policies and the way that they impact people and um, as the Zapatistas say, the way that they could potentially send people to death and oblivion. So between seeing that as teenagers, we were probably both about 17 when that, that happened in 1984, um, and the Chicana feminists thinking that came out of their experiences um, with the very patriarchal Chicano movement you know, their critiques, their um, intersectional lens really help shape how we think. And those are kind of the 
foundational um, beliefs, worldview, politics that shape how we engage in making this kind of work. So um, in the past few years, um, I've done some work that has really looked at more personal um, experiences because I was kind of forced to look inward when I was diagnosed with a very rare form of lung cancer. So, you know, honestly, everything that's happening with coronavirus, like I'm one of those people that um, is immunocompromised. I have lung issues. I have underlying lung issues before even being diagnosed with that. So, you know, I'm in that category of vulnerable populations. And um, so in thinking about what it means to be well in this world, <laughs> um, I've really looked at kind of the things that both literally and metaphorically fed me as I was healing from my lung cancer surgery. You know, I'm um, doing pretty well. My scans have all come out clear. I've done like three of them so far. Um, and, you know, part of what I think has been important in that has been how to look at what we go through in our personal lives and really connect it to these larger political issues and movements. And so I think I've seen myself making deeper connections, talking about issues that kind of undergird how oppressions um, seep into our intimate spaces. So like this piece is about child sexual abuse and the idea that um, children have autonomy, that young girls have autonomy over their bodies. And so this kind of helped me open up to talking about an issue that's hard to talk about. You know, sexual abuse is hard to talk about. It's hard to talk about when it's happening in our families. Um, it, it, I think it's, it's harder to address these kind of issues that, you know, they're maybe not from kind of a big external structure that kind of feels more far away. They're close to us. They're in our everyday lives. And so trying to put out stories that really show how things that don't have the really clear um, external you know, system of oppression, you know, that maybe feel um, too hard to talk about, like that's been an important part of the practice. And um, you know, this piece is about suicide and suicidal ideation. And um, I've, I've struggled throughout my life with um, depression and, um, and, and thoughts of suicide. And so this is really kind of a message to myself, to a reminder to really address um, how this these ideas kind of permeate into our minds and how they're not individual experiences just like these other pieces that feel you know very personal very intimate um but when you take a step back and really look at um how the rates of suicide <laughs> and the rates of suicide attempts are disproportionately impacting different communities like communities of color like in hawaii there's like you know a high rate of suicide among youth and the i don't remember the statistics off the top but if you go to the website there's like a breakdown of the numbers of people that are there's like one suicide every day um you know in indian country you know native people native young people have a disproportionality there too um black youth uh latinas have like a high rate of attempting suicide so like you can look into into um the way that people don't want to stay in this world and really connect it to these larger issues that impact people's lives um and i did this both as a piece to myself but also because there was a moment where there were a lot of suicides happening of high profile people and there was a lot of attention um, and rightly so, you know, I think when we lose anyone, um, 
it, it brings up a lot. And I also saw like on social media, a lot of the comments where people were very frustrated because they felt like um, these celebrity deaths really overshadowed the people in our everyday lives who we've lost. And um, I think instead of just only looking at it in that binary is like really kind of looking at writ large how how communities that are disempowered and marginalized are impacted so um these pieces have really helped to get at those things and i think as Jesus and i continue to work we're really looking at what lives in the core of our everyday lives like what are the things that we still hold on to as um, people in diaspora, as, as indigenous people in diaspora over generations. And what does it mean to go back and reclaim those stories, reclaim, you know, the stories of how we even got to where we're at, um, you know, what our families have gone through in order for that to be possible. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this class has that story, like how did you even end up at Berkeley? It's taken a lot and a lot of people and it all culminates. And so um, looking at that, looking at what we have that heals us, you know, the medicines that we have, um, what that even means, you know, and I'm not talking about kind of like pharmaceutical medicine, I'm talking about the things that heal us in our communities in our you know sometimes in our kitchens right like that's one of the places where we overlook some of those knowledges because it's so um quotidian it happens every day it's so normalized it's something you have to do and yet there's a lot that is carried in those it, histories of like how you even enter into that space and and you bring things together to to nourish yourself and so we've been doing a lot of work as well, really coming from a particular spiritual worldview and putting that into the context with the folks that we work and the, the issues that we're addressing, like issues around water, which are global, right? Um, I remember in high school, a teacher saying, you know, the next world war will be over water because at the time the Gulf Wars were raging. We know things are still happening. I think this country's been, um, invading um, places as long as I can remember since, since the Gulf War. Um, and we know there's been water wars that, and it's, it's happened, you know, like in Cochabamba, where I think the resistance from indigenous people really kind of gave hope. And we saw it again here recently in Standing Rock. And I think that really kind of helped shape um, a political lexicon, it really helped redefine that, you know, people in community um, in Standing Rock were saying, you know, we're not protesting, we're protecting the water. And this isn't just about us, this is about everybody, because if this happens here now to us, it's going to happen to everyone. And so um, bringing our particular histories and understandings of what sometimes just gets labeled as like a natural resource you know we pivot and say like that you know the water is a relative and what does it mean to care for a relative and to know that you have this interdependent relationship and i think as we've progressed in making this work uh, that comes from the spiritual worldview because th this has come up i think more and more in our work um, we also are trying to <laughs> indict the histories of like colonialism and repression and um, really kind of invert the way that uh, colonialism has impacted even the way we talk about place and name place, um, but always centering kind of the things that still sit with us. So uh, like this piece is really about how we build an altar in our home. So this is actually based on an altar that we built here at home that I photographed from like a second story to really 
show the things that we have in our everyday lives, the foods that we have in our everyday lives, but also really indict the colonial histories and the powers that um, invaded these lands. So to get to like kind of the heart of what has been our practice for the past 13 years, um, the work that we've done has really emerged at the core of this idea that has been established before us, you know, like we do not pretend to be um, inventing anything new. We're sustaining a tradition that has been happening for um, over a hundred years in the Americas, so-called Americas, um, of graphic artists, visual artists, um, using these political graphics to show solidarity, using that skill to be able to add additional tools in the resource box in the fight for liberation. You know, there's been collectives and groups that have been doing this before us, you know, as far back as the turn of the century, um, but also like the people that we've learned from, you know, we're doing this kind of work and continue to do this work, you know, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and we're building on that tradition because, you know, this struggle for liberation is a protected one. Um, and so there's history that we can look upon and learn from. So uh, there's organizations that have been really brilliant in how they've approached the work, like the organization for solidarity amongst the, I mean, it, it's OSPAL in Spanish. It always, it's a really long acronym um, for the peoples of Asia, I have to close my eyes, Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Africa. Okay, yeah, but I don't know. I always try to get it in the order that the, acronym is but I can't yeah in Spanish it's easier but I'll try to translate and mess it up anyways so OSPAL came together um you know in the late 60s uh in a conference and you know it came out of the Bandung conference and it was like in 65 um and it evolved into this idea of having a publication to be able to disseminate like political thought and kind of what's happening in you know revolutionary social movements around the world because in this you know this time in the late 60s we're talking about you know not just the idea of revolutionary but really armed conflict against colonial uh, occupation happening in the world and like things are actually People felt very optimistic about being able to um, break those occupations, for, for lack of a better term. And through this publication, which was a magazine called the Tricontinental, they were able to disseminate, you know, articles and, you know, worldviews out of Cuba, um, because that was where they were publishing it. And as part of that process, every time they sent out one of these magazines, you know, like I think there are monthly publications, maybe quarterly, um, they had a poster in the middle of the publication, you know, a political graphic poster. And it would address, you know, something that's happening in the world. Like you have um, Black Panther party artists doing, you know, art about things happening in, uh, Africa, and then you have people making work that's acknowledging what's happening here out from other countries, what's happening here in the Black Panther Party. So there was like this sense of an internationalist solidarity of this very kind of global politic. You know, there was a very, I feel like there was a very sophisticated understanding of um, the entanglement, um, you know, that the, the these folks were kind of like beyond just the national question. They were really looking at um, how these struggles for liberation were interlocked and what they could learn from each other. Um, one question I asked um, one of the artists from the Bay Area who actually went to Cuba, her name's Jane Norling, um, 
like how did they actually translate everything because every poster had maybe like five different languages um which really spoke to who they were communicating to you know it's like this very global audience with these posters and they said you know in the room you had someone who spoke quechua french farsi arabic like you actually it was a very internationalist um group of folks you know that were also producing these publications and so as an example Ospal and their model of work has influenced our graphics so during um the revolutions that were happening in tunisia and egypt i felt very inspired about their stories of kind of like um being fed up and finally like pushing back and resisting against the oppression there and so i read an article at my dentist office created this graphic put it up you know like i think one thing that we've practiced over the course of the last 13 years and we've seen really propagate is the use of like downloadable graphics so that you can make um, the graphics free and accessible to anyone that has access to a computer and a printer so this went up you know the the night after i read this really moving article about what's happening there and while i was sleeping uh organizers and um activists in bangkok downloaded the graphic took it to a print shop i assume uh blew it up as a poster and used it outside of their um embassy because the call at that point in terms of the timeline was a call for the ousting of mubarak and the you know in order to show solidarity if just people were asking folks all over the world go to your embassy you know like support our movement support what we're trying to do uh, and um this is an example of that i found this out you know weeks later because this photograph was taken by an associated press photographer and put into their database so it went all you know into publications all over and a friend of mine who was researching for an article sent me this um, months after that i actually found an e and message that the organizers had sent me who used google translate to let me know that they had done that and so i wrote back to them telling them you know like i found out i'm sorry it took so long i didn't see the message uh, it was like through facebook or something anyway so we also really are committed to the analog practice of screen printing posters you know like there's something very important and satisfying in actually putting hands to the tool and putting ink down on paper and then taking those prints and handing them to people you know like we love the way that the digital media and the digital platforms have opened up our ability to connect with people all around the world and we still think it's really important um, to do this analog process it's it's the part of the tradition that has always been there and so this is actually an example of us doing the same thing that organizers in bangkok did we went out to protest in san francisco at our em egyptian embassy and we took like 200 posters you know we gave most of the posters to um local high school students that are in a social justice academy we had been doing like workshops with them so when they saw us they were excited because i think for many of them it was the first time they had ever mobilized to um a protest like that um and so it was nice to be able to give them posters and somehow in all of this um one of the people that got a poster that day because we only did 200 um took that poster maybe like a year plus later went to cairo joined the youth movement there um and shared a kind of blurry dark picture taken in Tahrir square um uh, and told me that you know i wanted you to see this you know, there's not really a lot of um 
political graphics, but I took this poster and you could see this with the other young people. And I think this kind of like example for us about showing solidarity is really for us, what we're trying to underscore here is that what we've done is taken the skills, the gifts that we have of doing political graphics and use different methods to share that with the world, um, to share that with our community, to share that with our people. And in doing so, to help amplify and echo the message of the people that are on the front lines on, of um, the struggle for, for liberation, which is really what the message of the poster is about. It's like the people of Egypt that were really struggling and calling for change. And you know, this is a protracted struggle. It's difficult and it almost always is. <laughs> um, this next kind of case studies about Standing Rock and it's a, you know, a similar impetus where you know, young people had gathered and decided um, that something had to be done and they went to the elders and said, you know, we need to do this, we need to, um, come together and um, protect this land and protect the water. And that, that really helped kind of spark the movement um, that we saw happening in Standing Rock. And so, you know, we reached out to folks and tried to serve their goals, their purpose by making um, political graphic. You know, they had a petition going around. So, they asked for us to use this to help promote the petition. And um, this poster on the left, Jesus was kind of the, the key person and the lead on this. And so it helped them kind of mobilize folks that weren't in Standing Rock to do a simple action that could help support um, what they were trying to do. And, you know, we continued to answer the call of their request so like they wanted shirts and it was really great because then they would wear these shirts when they would be interviewed by media so that it was really clear when you see them you know even if you have your tv muted you knew what they were talking about or who they were and we sent posters out which is also a very common practice um for a long time i had a full-time career and so we couldn't always travel to the places where things were happening but we still wanted to do something and so often we would have something here locally in the bay like a print party and we would make posters and then we would send them off with usually in people's trunks you know like there's always someone driving and we fill their trunk with posters and so this was like the first round of that work and um we worked with other artists that were organizing um, art making parties, I don't know for lack of a better word, um, art builds to again equip folks there with uh, artwork from different folks like people that are First Nations in Canada were making designs, we we're making designs. There was like, um, you know, kind of people trying to show that solidarity from different places and this. Um, artist helped organize us and this is an example of um, how that approach helps kind of infiltrate traditional media and put an echo out the message of the water protectors um, really clearly you know because sometimes when you get interviewed by like tra traditional media outlets depending on who they are especially if they're mainstream conglomerated <laughs> media um, the problem always is that they kind of can reframe or kind of cut off what you're trying to say. And so this is our attempt at um, using that visual strategy and supporting and again, amplifying the voices of those that are on the front lines um, through the visual work. And we eventually went to Standing Rock to, um, to actually help make art every day in the art tent. And it was amazing. It was like, it was a glimpse of what could possibly be. It's a glimpse, it was a glimpse at like how society could actually function. All we ever had to do there was make art. And that's the thing like, I think we're like strongest at. 
And when we first got there, we got, you know, gave out t-shirts to everyone. And at the time we didn't know we were giving t-shirts to like the kitchen that was nearest to where we set up our cans. And they were like, don't worry, we will feed you. You know, you will be fed all the time. Anything you need in terms of food, you'll, you'll always be taken care of. And that was just true. Like we could just do what we were really good at. The folks in the kitchen did what they're really, you know, I felt like that was just true throughout the camp. And it was like, so challenging to come back to, you know, the world that we were in for that, where you have to do a million different things to survive capitalism, to survive these structures that we don't necessarily want to um, conform to, but we have to, like we're forced to. And, and it, and it was hard to go from like that way of being and then coming back to what we what we know, you know, the stresses of paying rent and, you know, getting to work and you know, the myriad of things that you can list that are very challenging. Um, so it was a very uh, eye opening experience. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think really the land being on that land and being with the people were the ones that gave us those insights. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Jesus and he's going to do the second half of this presentation. Hey everyone. Um, just, to, sorry, just to add a little bit to that, um, one of the things that uh, for us as artists, and I think Melanie was getting into, and we'll get a little bit into it right now about the um, the print parties or the the art workshops. Is that we used to go off of, or I used to go off of this idea of the temporary autonomous zone, Taz, um, and and a lot of our our parties or art builds like that um, go along that that way of thinking, where we set up these 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 spaces where for a moment we could have that that kind of autonomy, that freedom to create, to create art, to create relationships. And looking back to Standing Rock, it was something that we could have been prepared by understanding tasks, but it was really at another level of, um, of autonomy. And it was kind of really going back to what the Zapatistas were about, this whole idea of this indigenous autonomy of creating a space um, that is bigger than a, a room, a cultural center, but is uh, a space, a land, like the Zapatistas have the caracoles, the communities um, down in Chiapas where they've created their own schools, their own uh, their own hospitals, their own, their own services, right? And so that was what we were seeing up here. And so that, that was really a, a really interesting connection to, to be able to see is the way this, these kind of indigenous uh, ways of, lo of looking at autonomy were springing up here in the US. And it'll be interesting to see how those continue over time. Uh, but a big part of that was art because we, like Melanie said, we had the art tent and um, that was a big part of, of life there. So that was, that was really beautiful. Um, and I think that, that the way that art becomes a part of life is really important. And looking at these next pieces is, is a way of doing that. Um, we have here two that, that we've done um kind of even before the black lives matter uh movement started back in 2009 when oscar grant was um was killed here in the bay area in the fruitvale at the bar station at the local train station um i hope people know about that history if not there's all there's a film that was created about it which uh you could learn a lot about his, his whole case but um these posters are both examples of the way we've responded to um, killings by police and community. And these are just a couple of many posters that we've had to create over time, um, which has been really sad to be able to, to live in a world where young men, young people, um, queer and trans women, um, where their lives are taken really because of being black, brown, um, being seen as as someone as as a threat in the community, right? And that's where we can look back to Oscar Grant's story, who was killed on um, on New Year's Eve um, here in the Bay Area, and his life was taken. He was seen as a threat. 
he was stopped on BART and his life was taken. Um, in the days following, there was a cultural center here in uh, Oakland, Eastside Arts Alliance that called for people to create graphics and, and to put, 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 put up stickers in the community just to talk about what was going on. And so because of that, uh, we were inspired to create a poster, although this, the one that's shown here is the one that was created a year after. And, um, but we created a poster that was given away, kind of like what we've talked about. So it was this poster that we created. And for us, a big part of this was about paying respect to these people's lives who had been lost, right? And, and in a way, humanizing them. I think this is a thing that, that Black Lives Matter calls to, is this dehumanization that happens here in, um, in the United States, um, really in the Americas, around the world when it comes to race and to power uh, among, um, I would say, police officers, but also basically the state. Um, and so, Along, um, along the lines of this, a year after Oscar Grant was taken, um, we had put out some writing about it, um, but Melanie was asked to create this, this graphic on the left side um, as a way of, and, and to include a statement about um, the way that we work with art. And so that was really the, the way that that piece came together. Um, the one on the right is of Alex Nieto, a young man from San Francisco, uh, whose life was taken. And this is really an example of the kind of thing that happens in our world. Um, he was sitting at the top of Bernal, uh, Bernal Hill. He was sitting there eating a burrito. Um, a passerby, someone with a dog, um, passed by him. The dog started to bark at him. And Oscar, uh, Alex Nieto responded and someone saw that and called the police because they saw Alex as being a threat. Uh, they called the police, the police show up there a, a short while later. Um, there's a confrontation and Alex Nieto's life was taken uh, once officers pulled out their guns and started shooting. Um, it, it, it basically, the officers were uh, acquitted and let go. Um, people in the community started to organize though, right away. And so this poster was uh, a way of us expressing our solidarity. We created a digital version, we put it online, we created a, like digital prints, but we also made a screen printed edition that was given to the family and to an organization to help uh, to sell and help raise uh, funds for basically for his funeral costs. Uh, and so this is the kind of poster that we make and, and working in, in community, right? Um, I'm like, oh, this is the first poster that we created around Oscar Grant's life. And in this one, you see uh, the way that, I don't, it's kind of blurry, but what you see here is you see Oscar Grant in his face. Uh, and in the background is a funeral procession and that funeral of uh, mass grave. Um, and so the poster uh, was connecting, uh, like I said, it happened in uh, January 2009. Uh, at the same time as o Oscar Grant's death happened here, in in um in Palestine and Gaza, um, there was bombing going on by Israeli forces into into Palestinian communities. And so for us, uh, what we tried to do was to connect those two and think about state sponsored violence, right? Thinking about the state sponsored violence that happens through police action here in the United States, uh, and thinking about the state sponsored violence, uh, the US funds that go to Israel uh for weapons uh that are basically used to kill people in Palestine. And so um, that was a way of us connecting that. And, and like uh, Melia has said with the poster uh, on Tunisia and Egypt before, a big part of our practice is going, is making posters. And so like I was talking about uh, Eastside Arts Alliance giving us uh, the idea to make some uh, a political graphic. What we did is we went home, we designed, uh, we put this poster together, we printed it, and in the following days we continued uh, producing copies to go out to different rallies and protests and take them out to give them away. And for us, that's uh, a, a really big part of our practice and this idea, this, this gesture of making and giving away. Uh, this is something that for us really goes back to um, the work of artist groups like the Royal Chicano Air Force back in, uh, in Sacramento in the 1970s, artists 
a group of artists who were working together and they would paint murals, but a big part of their practice was also screen printing and they would make a lot of posters for community, a lot of which ended up being given away at rallies and protests and marches uh, and just put up in the community in general. And so that's one of the things that's really inspired our practice and helped us really understand how this, this medium can help people and how it can empower people. And for us, a big part of that is, is how the artwork itself and people having it, right, um, is, is a source of empowerment for them to be able to hold these pieces that make this claim of, of justice, of humanity, right? There's something there that um, people connect to. And same here, I think one of the things that, that was really beautiful was uh, seeing the way that Alex Nieto piece came alive in the community and the way that it was, um, it was included in marches, demonstrations, it was put in the dashboards of cars so you could walk around the Mission District and see them in public, you could see them in storefronts. <clears throat> and it's just the really beautiful part of, of the art making is being able to put the images out there and have them be part of, of this experience for people. And once again, providing a sense of empowerment. Um, which kind of goes into this idea of, of building community, which is uh, what we talk about the artwork. So this was a piece that Melanie created, and this um, goes off of a couple different things, but really what was going on at the time was really the separation of families uh, at the border, uh, thinking back to basically the, the the way that people were being locked up, families were being separated. And so this piece came out of uh, Melanie uh, Melanie's search for uh, community empowerment. And so the way that this piece comes together is, is looking at a lot of the artwork that was being created at the time and the kind of messaging that was being put out. And although a lot of um, a lot of pieces out there were really powerful. The kind of messaging that we saw was keep families together. And that, that kind of work is, is really beautiful and inspiring. But one of the things is that it, it, it lacks the teeth that really indicts a system. And what Melanie chose to do was to, to move to the, to the left of that and, and to create a, a whole other kind of messaging that had stronger language and had a, a, a more dynamic kind of image. And in that you see uh, this woman with the text Yavasta or, or stop now, kind of be translated, uh, this woman who's throwing away the border patrol and the police into the trash can, right? Uh, police and ICE collaboration, right? And so we're thinking about how um, police and ICE collaboration in communities um, is leading to basically the, um, the continuing of, of policing of black and brown bodies um, and the way that they're being kind of swept up in these raids, right, in the communities, as well as a border patrol that's actually uh, catching these people as they're trying to come into the country, right? So there's these two, this is kind of double-headed monster. Um, and at the bottom, you see the U.S. government is abducting migrant children and locking them in cages. So really indicting the system for what's going on, not just thinking about talking about separation, but really talking about the issue at hand, which is the abduction of migrant children, basically taken from their parents and then putting them in cages. And, and that was uh, a really serious thing. And so the way that Melanie worked on this is, is kind of taking a different approach, right? And doing something that is not just showing a man protecting a family, but showing the woman as the head of the household uh, protecting her child and being the one responding to, um, to both these threats, right? Police, ICE collaboration and the border patrol. Uh, and so this poster was designed, it was put online, it was created as a PDF, right? Um, to, for people to, to download and print their own versions. But the thing that, that was really um, spectacular about this was that we were also able to create uh, a screen printed version. And if you look at this poster, it has a lot of colors. I think it's like a five or six color poster. And so what we did is that we went to the studio 
um, we invited community because what we wanted to do is we wanted to print uh, a lot of posters. We ended up printing 250, which is a really huge run to do by hand. Usually we do something like 50 to 100 posters. So doing like two, two and a half times that is really laborious, especially when you're talking about five colors, because when you print, you have to print each color individually, let each color dry and move on to the next color. So on the right, you see kind of that process of uh, the last color being uh, printed there. But what we did is we, we opened up uh, the studio to community. We asked people if they wanted to come in and help print, and we got a really amazing response. We had people coming through for each color. Uh, a color takes about two, two hours to print, so we had people kind of helping us come through, and some would try to print. Uh, some would just help us rack us taking the prints and putting them on the rack, as you can see there. And it, it was a really beautiful experience because what we had was community printing this poster. And that's what I was referring to when I talked about the Royal Chicano Air Force. For them, the idea of printing was uh, of, of building community. And for us, that's something that we've been able to take in. Um, they would open up the studio, invite people, to come in and print, make posters, take a poster with them. And we've kind of continued that tradition. I think that's one of the things that when we look at Chicanx art now, uh, it's, it's a continuation of the kind of artwork that was being created. So it's a multi-generational movement. And so in that, we have that inspiration to, to take that practice and move it forward even, even uh, to another level. So I think that was a, a really beautiful part of that is how can we transform this? And so inviting people, uh, printing these posters, um, keeping, uh, um, we kept about 50 of them and invited the community to a local gallery uh, in downtown Oakland um, to share this kind of printing experience. So on the left-hand side, you see um, a community member with Melanie right there, and they were printing this poster. They were printing the black, the final color on this poster. And that was really beautiful because we had little kids come in and print. Uh, we had community with us, right? And people were able to take this poster and we took donations and we uh, sold some of these online. And for us, it was really uh, an amazing piece because what we were able to do by selling um, those posters online is that we were able to get enough funds to print. 13,000. We were able to print 13,000 posters um, that were 13 by 19. And in that, then we were able to put those online for people to order. Um, and basically for free, people had just had to pay for shipping. And so we were able to send those uh, all throughout the country and to put out this kind of messaging, right? And so for us, that was important, right? I think for, from the beginning, beginning Melanie, uh, Melanie's goal was to change kind of the narrative that was out there, to stop uh, thinking of, of, of just separating families, but really about how do we fight back? And that's the way we're able to take this in, in, in different stages is to like, put it online, create um, screen printed versions, be able to sell those to raise money to then print uh, a large quantity of posters that then could just be distributed throughout the country. Uh, and so that was something that was really powerful. And, and this is just one example of the print party or the print workshop. For us, we've, we've since 2010, um, and probably before that, but it was in 2010, uh, when we started doing this work in, in with real intention and probably the first one was at uh, Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland where we were making posters for the May 1st rally which kind of then became a tradition for us is to um, create a whole series of posters in solidarity with the community and, and migrants and different issues that kind of come up on on a yearly basis, right? And to invite community to print stuff and eventually invite other artists to come in and print um, and really with, with the intention of making um, what's become hundreds and sometimes thousands of posters to give away at, at marches and rallies. And, and over the years, that's, that, that model has continued to grow and we've been able to, to do different things and invite different communities. Um, and I think next, uh, just to, to kind of close it up, we have a um, little video, right? I'm gonna see how this works on here. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so while Jesus um, puts up the video, the, I wanted to actually show you what a print party looks like. And this is a print party that was organized um, in preparation for a legislative hearing that was happening in Sacramento. Um, people inside 
of the prisons had been organizing and putting a call out to people on the outside to support their organizing to end solitary confinement. And this legislative hearing was gonna address both um, essentially youth incarceration like CYA and adult incarceration and, and to really talk about um, how inhumane solitary confinement is. I mean, let alone the whole prison industrial complex, but you know, the issue was really about solitary confinement. And in, in the call, like I started thinking about like, we should do a poster and I was like, but it should be bigger than just us. And so we organized um, other artists that we knew, basically our friends that are printmakers throughout the greater Bay area. Um, we had folks from, you know, um, Davis area, San Francisco, you know, East Bay, all come with designs. I sent out all of the materials that had come from the prisoners and we borrowed our friend's shoe store. He had a shoe store and is really intentional about getting, you know, square footage for the shoe store that would allow community to use the space in a lot of different ways, <laughs> including this print party. Um, and so we ended up um, partnering with the coalition of organizers on the outside that were supporting the person who on the inside. So there was like members from, you know, this coalition that came basically like organizers that maybe aren't artists or like that's not really their thing, they're organizers. Um, and they partnered with the artist. And so it was a community building space as well as <coughs> very pragmatically creating these works that would be given to everyone that participated in the legislative hearing. And, you know, beautifully enough, there was someone that came and said, I wanted to, you know, the, someone that's a friend now, and he's like, I want to videotape this and document that it's happening. And so that's what we're going to share with you. Um, just a little glimpse because, you know, we talk about the work and it's really different to see it in the action. So share that with you now. <laughs> So that is our presentation. I'm not sure if we didn't talk about if there would be a Q&A for this. Are you willing to do a Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's try it. 
So in our class, when we usually meet in the Osher Theater, we've been asking everyone who's come to define what public art means to them and why it's important now. And I think that you've done such a beautiful job of that. And we're so lucky, I think, to have you in this moment where we've been told that we can't be in common in physical space and we have to be in common in virtual space. And you did such a nice job about thinking through the way that the virtual can intersect with objects and like be kind of the backbone, but be different from um, physical space too. So I was wondering, if we could ask you to think about how you're thinking about public art in an age where we're all worried about the coronavirus and we're supposed to be doing everything online, if the now could mean um, something particular um, in, in the case of talking to you. So what does public art mean to you and what does it mean specifically now? I'll start. So um, I was just saying to Jesus last night before bed that you know, I was like, is this the new normal? Because for me, um, this practice of having to self-isolate, like that started when I had my lung cancer surgery. So I had to um, self-quarantine because after surgery, if I got sick, it could turn into pneumonia and end up in the hospital, you know, like, so I feel like, you know, the unfortunate experience actually has prepared me. And then, you know, was like a year later less than a year later the fires and wildfires in california started happening and um, because of the vulnerability that was created by you know the lung cancer again like i had to you know i've i've gotten into the practice of having to self-quarantine to isolate and it's hard and it and there's a you know a price to pay but i I don't know, I guess I have practice now. So this happening now, I'm like, okay, this is again, another time. But in that, because I've already gotten the practice, like the Yabasta piece came out of um, this long period of time where like I, physically, I wasn't unable, I was just unable to do what our regular art practices because, you know, it was painful. So I did small movements. The very first slide I shared, was like this carved rubber stamp kind of, and I, I built it up little at a time. You know, it took me time, um, but essentially it was me pivoting to like, oh, what can I do? And so I think that's really the question, what can we do? I mean, we already, like in our practice, you know, putting things um, out digitally, you know, the social media we've I've been using social media and actually that's actually how we started talking was over MySpace <laughs> which dates us right it tells you when we were how long ago that was um but you know the practice of sharing work like I initially um put my artwork up in photo galleries on MySpace in like 2004 and it was before I had any opportunities to put art anywhere really um and now so i've i've been we've been doing that for a really long time and it's been an experiment you know it's i think it's gotten refined um over time but i think the fact that we have those kind of platforms that didn't exist for you know the people who taught us like they you know everything for them was in person it kind of <laughs> gives us the the leg up to be able to to share um, graphically. And I mean, I've actually been thinking about this um, opportunity to do this. I've been thinking about like putting it out there to see it's like, do people want me to do, like I was thinking of doing like a free workshop via this kind of format, which I've never done before, but it opens up the opportunity for us to stay connected, right? We have these great platforms that we can actually use to be able to do it, you know, like that didn't exist before for the folks that, you know, again, for the folks that taught us, like when they were engaging, like we just didn't have these tools. And um, one of Jesus's teachers, Juan Fuentes, I think in the most succinct way possible, um, just address, cause there, there's definitely been like this conversation about what's better analog or digital. And he's like, why wouldn't you use every tool at your disposal for your liberation? And we're confronted with that 
Um, and I think we're also confronted with the question of like slowing down and really looking at what's important. I mean, like capitalism is in crisis right now, right? Is in crisis. Um, the stock markets <laughs> are going to crap. Um, you know, it, I feel like with what's happening with this epidemic, this pandemic, um, it's kind of unveiling things. And so the question really is for, I feel like this question that I confronted in my personal life is like to really look inward and to start to think about the question of what's really, really <coughs> important. And how are we going <coughs> to creatively pivot? And I think, you know, we'll find out more as we engage. Like, you know, I'm starting to think about it. Like, what does it mean? Like, when we can't, like, I, as Jesus was talking, I was like, May Day, this might be the first May Day that we don't, you know, like, things in terms of, like, the public health projections in the United States, it's not looking good as not looking like things are going to get better anytime soon. So, you know, usually we do like these art builds at the end of April. I'm like, I don't think things are going to be okay so that we can be out there. So this is going to be the first May Day and all these thoughts started swirling. So like, that's the exact question, like, you know, in place of that, because even if it's maybe okay for, you know, you know, because, so much of how they've talked about this, I'm still in that very like small percentage that's highly vulnerable to the virus. So I know I'm not going to be able to. And I've asked Jesus, you know, like, you know, he also needs to kind of practice among that because we're always together. So if he if he goes out, he could be a carrier and then bring it here, and that's not good. So you know, we'll have to figure out what's going to be the creative way um, to be able to. Uh, not freeze and not be inactive but to um could we do something creatively like maybe we'll do some art workshops that kind of take people like how to design a poster and you know like that we can still have voice and and i think um for us because we're like always about social movements and organizing it's like partnering with them to really think about like, what's the ask right now? You know, maybe, you know, the ask because it's International Workers' Day, you know, is around paid sick leave, right? Like how many industries for folks that are marginalized don't, can't even think about missing work because they don't have paid sick days. And in the Bay, like rent is ridiculous, right? Like, so like these questions of like, will there be, like really kind of progressive policy like in i forget was it in south korea i don't remember where where one of the places where this big outbreak where they have or maybe it was italy a moratorium on um it might have even been here <laughs> a moratorium on collecting uh mortgage payments and rent for like a certain period of time i was like whoa like how would that even like it feels so beyond, like I could almost can't, I'm like, is that even possible? And then that kind of just calls into question, if you can do it temporarily, what are the bigger kind of revolutionary changes that we can demand? I think this opens an opportunity for us to um, ask for what we really want. Because sometimes I think what ends up happening is that we're pragmatic and we fight for what we think we can win. And I think in these fissures, in these cracks, we can ask for more. We can demand more. Um, so yeah, and then that's kind of my train of thought. I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I don't know if you have that. <laughs> no. I, all I can think about is how, how does art continue in the, in like the zombie apocalypse? And <laughs> Uh, that is kind of what I'm thinking about right now is just in, in that kind of extreme, I don't know, but no, I'm, I'm just being kind of, kind of trying to be funny about it, but it, it's, it, I don't, I'm, I don't even know. I mean, I think in the United States, like Melanie was saying, um, I feel like, um, since she had her surgery and I said, right around the same time I started teaching, uh, I feel like every semester there's been some kind of global challenge 
that limits what we can do. And I just, uh, within that, I think it's just, we, as Melanie was saying, it's just finding ways to get creative, to continue doing things right now. Uh, we're figuring out from my other class how Melanie can do a drawing workshop that she was gonna come and do in person. And now we're trying to figure out how do you do that virtually uh, to capture the same kind of experience, of experience right? And, and so it's just like, it's, it's just crazy. I don't know, that's all I can, yeah. I, I mean, I, no, go ahead. It's exciting. I think it just, it pushes us to be even more creative. Love you, that's such an inspiring answer. Professor Rayford and I were talking about how we didn't know how to plan for a COLA strike, which might happen, is probably happening next week, and then also a pandemic. But what you're saying is like, maybe the pandemic opens the space for some other kind of thing, or how to think about those in some different relationship. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, that's, it, it, looking at the, at the, not all the ways that it makes it harder, but really, like, what does it open? What does it open? Even yeah, what spaces can crack at yeah. this moment yeah. in a different way? Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a couple questions from students, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, the, a question that's recurred a couple times in different ways is whether in thinking about art as a tool for social transformation, do you, how do you think about your artwork in relationship to propaganda? Like, do you think about any kind of hierarchical difference between art as a political tool or art as a formal tool? Or is that something that's, um, that's of interest to you? Or is that something that you thought through? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think we, we've, we both talked about this. So it's one of those things that, that we think about a lot. And, and there, so <laughs> there, there's different ways of looking at, at, I mean, for us, we make art, we also make design, which is a form of communication, right? And so what, you know, you bring up words like propaganda. And so th there's all these things that come up when you think about posters and, and prints and, and, but for us, it's, the purpose for us of making the art that we do is really to inspire people and to let people know that they're not alone, that we are in solidarity with them. And so that when you, when you think about the work that we do about Palestine or about the Middle East or about South America or about Africa, these places that we will have very little presence in physically, we, we, we make this kind of work in, in solidarity with them. So for us, we don't think about it as just as propaganda, as, as trying to um, change people's minds. I think for us, it's, it's we're, what we're trying to do. We're not trying to, uh, I think some people talk about, well, I wanna make work that changes racist minds. And I, I don't think we're gonna do that. I think racists are racist and that's uh, a bigger issue. And I think that's a, the understanding that we have is that Racism uh, is, is uh, a systemic issue. It's not just uh, a personal issue and changing one person's mind is not necessarily an effective way of, of, for us using our time. So for us, in a lot of ways, we make work that inspires people. So when we w make work about migration, like the Vasaya poster uh, that Melanie made, it was really about moving a way of thinking for the people forward. It was, it was to inspire them. It wasn't necessarily um, to, it was to show them the world that we live in and the way that they can act. And, and that was kind of the, the social part of it is how could people come out and help? How could people uh, take the posters that we were selling, the, the, the digital ones that people could order online for free and just pay for shipping? And how can people get those and put them up in their community? Yeah, I think it's interesting too, because particularly with poster art, this question of propaganda emerges quite often. And I actually think a lot of what actually is propaganda doesn't get examined. So it's almost like snitch jacketing, like, oh, we're gonna put this on you. Um, it, it, and it's kind of like, it's a way to marginalize what we're doing. And it ha it's, it's happened not just to us, but like historically, because you have, um, for example, like you have um, military consultants that get hired for movies like the big comic book movies, um, like Marvel movies, um, what's, what's, um, Cap, Cap, not Captain Marvel, uh, what's her name, the one with Brie Larson? Yeah, Captain Marvel. Car Captain Marvel, sorry. <laughs> so for example, that, when we went to see it in the theater, the lead before that was a military recruitment video, and, and so like you can look, if, 
you know, because it's not on the surface, you can look and see, like, they actually hire because she's, like, what, in the Air Force or something like that. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm like, this propaganda! And yet, like, because of the way it's woven in, you know, people aren't going, hey, did you go see that propaganda film, you know, that's from comics? Um, and that's just one example. Like, I think there's a lot of content that's, especially in popular culture, that really is straight up propaganda where like there's money flowing and there's interests that are advancing an agenda and yet we're always asked is your art propaganda I'm like we're like two people in the bay uh most of our start we just printed in our, our living room and the majority of how we started was self-finance by our job and you're asking us if we're like a propaganda arm, like who we'll ask Fox News if they're a propaganda, you know, like just to put it in, I think, um, context of scale and impact. Um, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and I think this is always my thing. This is what's led to the collapse of our society um, because we don't always think of, we always think of things like propaganda as being highly overly political but i would i would say that even things like uh the kardashians uh and their shows on on e are propaganda for capitalism and so it, it comes in different forms and and in that way i mean maybe we are propaganda um but we're good propaganda <laughs> i knew you'd have a good answer for that one so one thing that we have in the digital realm is that we can just go as long as we want, but we're not going to keep you too long. <laughs> Another question that we've been asking all our guests, and given your background at Berkeley, we're hoping that you'll have an answer for this. Our students are at the end of the class going to come up with their own interventions and proposals for public art, either additions or subtractions on the campus. So is there a public art intervention that like, you have in your mind that you would make on, on Berkeley campus? Oh my God, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, my class is kind of doing a similar thing. Um, and I, I, was, I was thinking about one. Um, I mean, there, there's a couple. There's one which I'll say, which was really amazing, which uh, I worked with a couple students on. And theirs was to go into to cover the name of Kroger Hall and to rename it Ishi Hall. And so to me, that was something that was really cool. Uh, but one of the ones I've been thinking about right now, because I did uh, a little thing, um, a little kind of conversation about this and, and thinking about campus and what's happened on campus. And uh, when I, w I was around there in the late 90s and my time there with uh, like the occupation of, of the Campanile or the Third World Strike uh, and thinking about the takeovers of different halls. Um, and now one of the things that um, if you look at any door on campus, any double door, only one side will have a handle. And the other side, you'll see where the, the handle was taken off. And that's because um, when buildings get taken over, usually the doors get uh, locked using a chain or a U-lock or something. And so uh, one of my public interventions was to go around and install handles on all the doors that, uh, of buildings that have been occupied. And that led to conversations of how we could take that to different to, to like to, to different levels, like Melanie mentioned, how can you project them, which because the first one might be illegal. <laughs> so how could you project them? And, and really, how does this start a conversation about what's happened? And so I think that was kind of Melanie's addition <laughs> yeah. to it, was how do, you, how do you take that, right? But- Like um, there's levels of risk, right? And you know, sometimes people like to go high risk because they want to be provocative, but it's a question like, what's the risk what's the gain and I was like well maybe it's <laughs> you know because that's probably arrestable what if you like photographed everything and just posed it as an interrogation like why do why do all the doors on campus only have one handle and you I mean you could go really deep into it um, because it, it, it speaks to a, a, a history of the insurgent spirit of students on campus demanding better of the institution and folks might not know that you might not even notice that right because you're like so kind of deeply engaged in what you have to do next get to class or you know uh whatever i do want to address i saw in the questions about how we access publics um 
I do think it's an important question, right? Um, and and the question of like technology, you know, it's it's you know, depending on on who you're trying to engage with, it still might be a barrier to accessing them. And that's where I go back to like, what are the creative ways to do this kind of work? And I think that's the challenge ahead of us. Like, I clearly don't have the answers. I have, you know, some ideas just based off of my own experience of like, you know, the past three years um, being preparation for this, for me personally. Um, but I, th I, I think those are the questions are being asked rightly so it's like well what if you have communities that you're trying to work with that you know they're either like not um able to access the tech or they're you know the you know, even kind of like the maybe the places where they're at the broadband is really slow and you would have issues with actually being able to like <laughs> you know have something like what we're having right now you know lots of questions come up and i think those are the those are the challenges that are posed in front of us that we have to address and start thinking about and and do that collectively. I mean, I think that's what's the beauty of like having a class like this, you know, that you have a space even online to be able to kind of uh, generate ideas and kind of like build on each other's ideas. Um, I think, you know, everything happening with um, the organizing around COLA presents an excellent opportunity for public art intervention, but there's so, honestly so many things that need to be addressed um, that like you just have ripe opportunity. I mean, a lot of what I've been reading across universities, like with the question of whether they're being closed is like, you know, can't, you know, when there's a call for students to go home, like I never went home when I was at Cal. I didn't have any money to leave. I had to stay. It was so expensive to, to go back home because I was from SoCal. So like, if that would have happened when I was a student, I don't know what I would have done. Food insecurity would have also been an issue for me um, because it was already very difficult. But like, if you close all the places where students have food access, like that's another key issue that the institution has a role to play in so to do a whole thing around, i mean there's just i feel like there's just like an endless number of issues um and i think honestly i think the ones that you can connect to really deeply like you know i give those examples because i'm like you know if that would have been me at that at the time when i was a student those were the things that come up and i think that's what students can ask of themselves like what are some of the things that I'm connected to personally? Because then you have more, you know, when, when it's coming from a place that you've experienced, you just have more to be able to offer because you know, you know, there's a, a basis of knowledge. There's an episode basis of knowledge. And so that's where you're going to really kind of generate a lot because you're like, I know this happens and I know that happens because I experience it. So that's where I would encourage students to come from that place. Like, where are some of the things that you know have been touching close to home because then when when you're articulating something in the form of a public work it comes out that much stronger that was awesome thank you so much i'm hoping this recording works because i was very <laughs> inspired and i think others will be as well i think that's a good place for us to wrap it up so thank you. Thanks thank everybody you. who's here. Bye. Bye. Thank you all so much for coming. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and feel free if you, I saw like a couple of things. There's a lot more on our website. Like if you want to see some of the installation work. Um, also, there's videos out there too. You just Google Digny Laravel, then you'll find other, oh, let's just put that up. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we're always limited in time. So we share just little nuggets. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Stay safe, everybody.